42 verse 1. Psalm 42 verse 1. We read and develop that for you. Psalm 42 verse 1. And the scripture says, I long to drink of you, O God, to drink deeply from the streams of pleasures flowing from your presence. My longings overwhelm me for more of you. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so this message is entitled, In Pursuit of Him. In Pursuit of Him. And there's our scripture there and our theme, which is important as we go forward. The theme is this, only God can satisfy the inner longing of your heart. Amen. Amen. In reading through the Gospels, you will never find the Lord Jesus making people ashamed of prayer or condemning them for not praying. But rather, he said to them, when you pray, remember that as he spoke to the disciples, he said, when you pray. Whilst the disciples were walking with the Lord Jesus Christ, there was no need for them to pray in the sense of petitioning the Lord for anything, because the Lord was with them. And whilst he was with them, they had every need met and every desire fulfilled. So there was no need for them to pray. But he did say to them, when you pray, because he knew there was coming a time when he wouldn't be with them in their midst and that they would need to pray in light of the challenges of life. So he said to them, when you pray, and there are different types of prayers. There's prayers of adoration. There's prayers of lamentation. When we simply cry out to God because of what is going on in life, what we're going through, those are prayers of lamentation. There's prayers of adoration when you just simply feel the need to express your worship to God. Those are prayers of adoration. Then there's thanksgiving when you see and recognize the undeniable hand of God in your life, over your life, keeping you, saving you, sparing you from something. And that is a prayer of thanksgiving and that's important. And then there's the prayer of petition when you have specific needs and requests and you need to bring them before the Lord. Those are called prayers of petition. Then there's prayers of deliverance. We realize there are things that we are experiencing, things that we are going through, that we do not have the wherewithal and the power within ourselves to deliver ourselves from that circumstantial situation. Those are prayers of deliverance. Hallelujah. Remember Paul and Silas in prison prayed prayers of deliverance. And then there are prayers of guidance when you need God to simply guide you and show you the way forward. Those are prayers of God and guidance. But let me just say this. There is a very real difference between saying grace and fellowshipping with the Father. And we are talking more about fellowshipping with God this morning, more than prayer. But it's a form of prayer. But like I said, there's a difference between saying grace and fellowshipping with the Father. Saying grace is just mumbling a few words and getting stuck into what is on the table in front of you. But fellowshipping with the Lord is an entirely different uh, medium itself. Let me just say this, everything about you was made by God and for God and created for his presence. Think about that. When we came into this place, we set it up to meet our needs. It's not designed to serve any other purpose. It was designed to suit and to meet our needs because we knew what we had in mind in terms of what we wanted to do here. So we set up and structured the place to fulfill that need. When God created us, he created us with that in mind, that he has certain things that he needs to have fulfilled and can only be fulfilled uh, through us. We were designed for that. And hence, it's important to ask ourselves, Lord, in terms of how you created me and why you created me and why you brought me into this world, help me to fulfill that because you have an express need for me to fulfill that specific purpose. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so the true longing of our heart is to know him because we were formed in his very image. Just like every one of us wants to know all we can learn about our earthly fathers, we should endeavor to learn everything we can about our heavenly father. Amen. As we enter his presence and come before him, we are connecting with our true source. I don't know if you connected with that, but let me just say it again. When we enter his presence and come before him, we are connecting with our true source. He is the one who put us here. He is the one who sustains us. He is the one who keeps us. Hallelujah. He is the one that helps us to fulfill his plan and purpose in our lives and for our lives. Amen. 
Praise God for that. Glory to God. It's in his presence that we are empowered. It's in his throne room that we come to life like never before. Hallelujah. Let me speak to you about a moment for a moment about God's chosen home. God's chosen home. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16 says the following. It says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Mm -hmm. Now isn't that a wonderful uh, scripture, a verse to reflect on? It's just so comforting, so heartwarming. But there is a requirement that goes with that. It doesn't just happen on its own. And the requirement is this, found in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. God says, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Before yes. God can choose to make you his habitation, you've got to follow that requirement. He says, come out from among them. We cannot be with them and with God. It's either with them or with God. And as we sang that song, I need you more, I need you more. I don't want to go back to, the, to my old way. It's about choosing that I'm not living that old life. I'm living this new life in Him. And I'm pursuing Him. That's why the message is entitled, In Pursuit of Him. Hallelujah. So he says, come out from among them. Now you know who he's referring to when he says, come out from among them. It's different to you. It's different to you. It's different to each and every one of us. But we know that old habitation, that old hangout that we used to have and enjoy. He says, come out from among them. If they are not serving God, what are you doing with them? If they are not confessing and calling upon the name of the Lord, what are you doing with them? Come out from among them and be he separate, says the Lord, and I will receive you and you shall be my people. So firstly, he says, come out from among them. And we need to make that distinction in our walk with God. Are there things, fellowships, companies, and people that we are still hanging out with that we should not be hanging out with? What fellowship has light with darkness, says the word of God? What fellowship do believers have with unbelievers? What are you doing with them unless you are sent to minister to them? Jonah didn't want to go to the Ninevites, but it was God who said, you will go and you will preach to them. But initially he didn't want to go to them because he knew those were sinners. And he had the presence of mind to make that distinction. So unless you sent to the unsaved, you've got no business fellowshipping with them. Because the Bible says, what fellowship has light with darkness? In this room, the light is on, there's no darkness. There's no room for the darkness to operate because the light supersedes the power of darkness. And if we are in the light, what are we doing with people that are in the darkness? Because their deeds are deeds of darkness. And the Bible says it is a shame even to speak of those things that are done in darkness. So we have to come out from among them. And the Lord says to be separate. What does it mean to be separate? It doesn't mean to stand out in the middle of the yard and let the rain or the hail pelt you over the head while the weather does what it's doing to us of late. That's not what it means to be separate. To be separate means not to be entangled with the entanglements and the involvements of this world, the world's system and the world's way of operating but you are separate in the sense that you are available to God if God should say let's do this you are free to do it and not say oh no sorry you know I belong to this family we can't do that or I belong to this religion I can't do that no you are separate from the things of the world and available for God's express use and God's express purpose amen, amen. hallelujah so now watch this God does not offer uncondition God does not make this offer to you unconditionally. He says he will be your God. And then he says you shall be my children and I will be your father. But God is not that hard up and that desperate to become a father or to be your father if you are not prepared to fulfill the requirement found in 2 Corinthians 6.17 where it says be he separate, come out from among them. Amen. Praise God. But now let me go back to my point. God's chosen home. I said all of that to set this up for you. God can fill the universe with his wisdom, his glory, and his order. But he longs for a home, a place of rest. We are talking about the creator of heaven and earth. Look at all the wealthy men. Look at all the accomplished men in the world today, let alone in the past. The past, the entrepreneurs, and, and powerful men and women of note and accomplishment. Look at the present uh, 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 set of accomplished businessmen and entrepreneurs today. Where are they living? They're living in the palatial places of the country and of the world. 
They've got homes and fancy places because that's where they choose to live. Because of their prestige, their power, and their position. Now look at God himself. He is greater than any earthly person. He's created everything. He has a home. Heaven is his home. It's his throne. But still he chooses a place to live right here on earth. And he's not looking for Beverly Hills. He's chosen you. He's chosen you. Hallelujah. He can fill the he can fill the universe. He can <coughs> find the place of rest anywhere, but he chooses <coughs> to find the place inside of you. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful to know? That that's special that God's not looking for a place, he's looking for a person. Mm -hmm. So listen to this. When we when we finally pass from glory, when we finally pass into glory, brother, you know what I'm talking about. When we leave this earth, when we pass and leave this body behind, he will say to us, you have given me residency in your life and in your body all these many years, regardless of the, the difficulties and the challenges that you faced. Now that you've put off this tabernacle of flesh, come and enjoy my holy habitation where you can abide with me and live with me forever. Because you've given me residency in your life. Now take up residency in my kingdom. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to know that. Praise God. <clears throat> so let's move on. So he's chosen to live inside of us. Praise God. He becomes our content. And we become his container. And Paul made a beautiful statement when he said, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of, our, not of ourselves. There's the scriptures there for you. In the Old Testament, he gave a set of laws to live by, and then he put the laws in a box and he dwelt among them. That's how God operated in the Old Testament. He gave them a set of laws, and then he put it in a box called the Ark of the Covenant and then God tabernacled with them. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament, He comes to live in you and He helps you carry out the righteous requirements of the law. Isn't that wonderful? So Colossians puts it this way, Colossians 1.27. It says, the secret is simply this, Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So let me read out the entire verse. It is Christ in you. Yes, Christ in you bringing with him the hope of all glorious things to come. It goes on to say that the hope of glory is the fulfillment of God's promise to restore us and all of creation. We all are created to be the Father's living vessels, filled with all that he is. He becomes our content, our substance, and we become his container. We are containers of Christ. We are containers of Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so Paul says this is a, a special treasure that we have in earthen vessels. In a very real way, God needs you to become his completion, his fullness on the earth today. And let me just express it to you this way, the statement that I just made. In the same way that a man becomes complete when he is married, because without marriage, a man is sort of incomplete, you know, the whole story of marriage. They say, when you get married, you find your better half. Because they liken mankind unto a circle. A man is half circle. The wife is half circle. When you come together, you've got a full circle. That's the meaning or the connotation behind marriage. So regardless of how big and how powerful a man is, you're still half. You're incomplete. But when you are married, you become complete. Right? So watch this. You become complete. You may be a man, and that you are, but you will never be a husband. You're not a husband until you are married. Then you become a husband. But you are a man. Whether you're 15 or 50, you're a man. But when you're married, you become a husband. So watch this. Now let's bring this over to God. Great as God is, He's not a father until He has children. And God can do all things but he still remains God. But he becomes a father when he has children. And when you 
become his child, he becomes complete in a sense. You are helping him complete something that is not complete in him. You are helping him do something he cannot do for himself. So when you become his child, he becomes complete because now he can become father. Without children, you cannot call him father. Without healing him, you cannot call him healer. Without him providing for you, you cannot call him provider. So our needs and our situations help him to become complete in terms of who he is. And he looks for that. Are you beginning to see your importance to God now? You're not just an irrelevant somebody living on this planet. Hallelujah. Amen. God only can become complete when he has children and that is what we do for him. We make him something that he is not. We give him a title. We give him a name. Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Right. So are you beginning to see your value in him? Let me move on. Let me move on. Adoration turns into transformation. Adoration turns into transformation if we will be patient with the process. And what is the process? The process is called salvation. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 9, 29, as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. And that's amazing that as Jesus prayed, he was transfigured. The connotation and the application to us is this, that as we pray, we become transfigured. Transfigured means changed. Glory to God. And the scripture is there. It's found in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 over there. It's so powerful if you read it. It says, we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our face. And with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit, praise God. That translation, the Passion Translation, says it so clearly for us. Amen. Amen. We become like him. Praise God. I want to share this point with you in closing that is really, really applicable to us today. To love Him must be <coughs> our supreme occupation. To love Him must become our supreme occupation. Now, many of you are saved delivered, sanctified, set free, anointed, called, doing whatever it is you're doing. Praise God for all of that. You've got your set of Christian values and norms that you live by. And uh, there's pursuits in life. There's goals that you have for the Lord. Surely you do. I'd like to believe each and every one of us has got that kind of thing in, in place. These, these, these values and, and these goals that you're pursuing for the Lord and in the Lord for that matter. Amen. Now, I know you've got earthly goals to get a house, get a bus, a truck, an airplane, and all those earthly things. All of that's good. I'm not against that. But how many of us have got some specific goals that you want to see accomplished for the Lord? Amen. So, in light of that, and I'm glad you have got that, or perhaps you are pondering that this morning, let this become our preoccupation to love Him more. To love Him more. Amen. And that's where that scripture comes in that we read right in the beginning. Um, in Psalm 42 verse 1, he says, I long to drink of you, O God. To drink deeply from the streams of pleasure flowing from your presence. My longing overwhelms me for more of you. Let me just go back to the scripture and just uh, let you reflect upon it. It says, I long to drink of you, Lord. And this part is very important here where it says, my longings overwhelm me for more of you. From the day you got saved, there was a desire. I don't know if you, if you realize that. How many of you experienced that? In your prayer time, when you're reading the Bible, when you're in a service like this, a meeting like this, that need, do you feel that need? Do you feel that hungering for God? Are you beginning to recognize that it's a hunger for God? And not for things. And as a Christian, let me say this to you. You need to understand this longing. If you don't interpret it correctly, 
Satan will give you counterfeit stuff True. to fulfill that inner longing. <laughs> Satan knows that if you don't satisfy that spiritual longing through God and with what God has to offer, he'll give you a counterfeit type of thing. You know when a person is uh, uh, dehydrated and you are thirsty, you may be locked in a room like this, and I've got a cup of paraffin, not me. Circumstantially, there's a cup of paraffin here. There's a cup of petrol down here. There's a cup or a glass of seawater. You're locked in and you're thirsty, and you're thirsty, and you're thirsty. Eventually, logic doesn't hold out. Your need, your thirst will override logic. You'll drink the paraffin. You'll drink the seawater. You'll drink the petrol, thinking that this is going to help you. But the end result is this. It will actually kill you. <clears throat> but that thirst is so strong, it begins to override logic. Child of God, listen to this. If you don't allow Him to satisfy you, all your Christian logic, I shall not do this, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not do this, your need will override those things. That's how come so many ministers, so many people called Christians transgress and fall into sin. And people look at him and say, but how? He's a Christian. How did you fall into that? How did you give yourself to that addiction and that perversion? It's because that inner longing was so strong and you did nothing to fulfill it by turning to God. The cry, the inner longing overrides your Christian logic and you end, end up doing something that is foolish. Yeah. Yes? You get it? Yeah. So the writer says, I long for you. And he says, my longings overwhelm me to the point that it, your need for God can be your undoing. Yeah. And you're not realizing it. What I really need is Him. That's all you need is to turn to Him and to be in His presence and He fulfills that need yeah. and that peace floods your soul. And the thing that is tempting you fades. Yeah. And when you find you're being really tempted again, then you know that that is an inner longing. Scientists and medical uh, uh, professionals tell us that when you are feeling thirsty, it's already the second or third degree of dehydration. You should have realized you needed to drink something long before you felt the need to drink. If you're feeling the need, you're probably in second and third stage of dehydration. So when your soul is longing and you feel this temptation it is really rising up inside of you and I want to go back to my old way. That thirst on the inside has not been fulfilled. And Satan knows how to get us back and back to our old way. In pursuit of him, let him fulfill your inner longing. Amen. Let's move on. When your soul longs for God, either he satisfies it or the devil will. The need won't just stay there, neutral. Either God's going to satisfy it or the enemy is. Make up your mind today. Amen. In John 7, 37, Jesus said on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and called in a loud voice, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow, shall flow streams of living waters. Hallelujah. Streams of living waters. <clears throat> Our supreme preoccupation is to love him more. Let's go back to that. Our supreme preoccupation must be to love him more. And I'm reading to you again from the passage translation. There it is down there, John 14, 21. You can follow there. And the passage translation says, Those who truly love me are those who obey my commands. Whoever passionately loves me will be passionately loved by the Father. And I will passionately love him in return. And I will reveal myself to him. This is something we must be crying out to God for. For him to reveal himself to us. You don't know everything about him. You think you do. You only know a little. A five-year-old child understands so much about its father, earthly father. All it knows is, I want sweets. And sweets come from him. When you're 10 years old, you realize, I want clothing. Clothing comes from him. And when you're 20, you say, I want a car. Where does a car come from? Car comes from him. The five-year-old five does not understand what the 10-year-old knows about the father. 
In the same way, the five-year-old does not know what the 20-year-old knows about the father. It's as you grow in him, you realize and learn more about him. So he says, if you passionately love me, I will passionately reveal myself to you. It's not just that he's loving us in return, but he's revealing himself to us. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And I love this in Psalm 119. So let's just read it. And together, um, I'm going to read it and we'll do the repeat side together. So let's just repeat together and say, guide me, Lord, in the way of your commands. So I'll read and then we'll say, we'll say it together in unison. Blessed are undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And we repeat and we say together, guide me, Lord, in the way of your commands. Verse 27, make me to understand the way of your justification, and I shall be exercised in your wondrous works. And we say together, guide me, Lord, in the way of your commands. Let that be a prayer. Let that sink into you. Guide me, Lord, in the way of your commands. Just reading it and thinking you know it is not going to help you fulfill it. But he says in prayer, guide me so that I can do it. Many of us know what is right to do, but we don't do it. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So when he says guide me, it means to enable me. Let me see it clearly and understand it that I might obey you in this regard. Amen. So as we give him our hearts in prayer, he gives us his heart in exchange. Isn't that a wonderful exchange? Transforming us from deep within. The more you give your heart to prayer, the more you'll experience his presence. As you go in this journey, you will find that you just can't go on without a fresh infilling Amen. from the fountain of life. Prayer gives us that infilling. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. After years and years of doing this, what we realize is that we need to just take him in. In every season, every month, every year, we just need him more and more. We need him more and more. And the Bible says, those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Glory to God. Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Prayer is like breathing, spiritually speaking. What we exhale, he inhales. Can I say that again? What we exhale, he inhales. There's a health, science tells us that there is a healthy understanding between plants and humans. And that is why a lot of people have a plant in their bedroom. It's not for decoration, unless it's an artificial plant. But you've missed the whole point of having a plant in your bedroom. It gives off oxygen and it oxygenates the air in which you are sleeping. And the amazing thing is that as you're sleeping and you're breathing, you are exhaling carbon monoxide. The plant takes the carbon monoxide. It needs it. So there's a health, healthy understanding between the plant and the human. What you give off, it inhales. What it exhales, you inhale. And it's the same relationship with God. What we exhale, he inhales. Now, what do we exhale? Are the things we don't need. You don't need uh, glory, praise, and honor. That belongs to him. You give off like we breathe off. We give off prayer. We give off praise. We give off glory. He inhales it. And what he exhales is what he does not need, but it's what we need. Blessings, healing, provision, and power. He don't need it. He exhales it. But there must be this healthy medium of you exhaling and him inhaling and him exhaling and him inhaling and him exhaling and in you inhaling what he's exhaling. And that is what we need. And that is how we exist in him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah this morning. Praise God for that. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen.